on the dismantling of Hong Kong civil society will come to order. Earlier this month, Hong Kong marked the 25th anniversary of the British handover to the People's Republic of China. Instead of celebrating the high degree of autonomy and universal suffrage promised to the people of Hong Kong, this anniversary serves as an occasion for Chinese leader Xi Jinping to go to Hong Kong and flaunt the control he now wields over the city. It has now been two years since implementation of Hong Kong's draconian national security law. In these two years, authorities- Javier, Javier, Corona. In these two years, authorities completed the transformation of Hong Kong from an open society into a city gripped by fear, fear of the mainland's authoritarian repression. A city that once boasted a vibrant civil society and pro-democratic institution saw these pillars of what made Hong Kong so special systematically dismantled. The Hong Kong government now jails protesters and politicians, shuts down independent media, and silences critics, even criminalizing dissent. At least 10,500 Hong Kongers have been arrested for political and protest-related offenses. No fewer than 123 individuals face national security charges and will likely be tried with few or no due process protections and with possible extradition to mainland China. At least 65 civil society organizations have shut down or left Hong Kong for fear of prosecution under the national security law. Today, sadly, that once vibrant civil society is crushed, muted, and scattered. Today's hearing offers a microcosm of what's happened and what remains. Our witnesses bring a deep history in civil society in Hong Kong, as well as experience being persecuted and having to continue their work in exile in Tokyo, in London, in Los Angeles, and here in Washington, DC. Like so many, they continue to fight for the people of Hong Kong and its once proud institutions. In recent months, this commission has heard from dozens of Hong Kong's true patriots, journalists, human rights advocates, students, former legislators, social workers, and religious clergy, non-governmental organization staff, doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers, and trade union organizers. In the coming days, we will release a report on what those members of civil society have experienced largely in their own words. And today's hearing offers a glimpse into that bleak picture. The Chinese government's policy of crushing resistance turns Hong Kong into a city subject to centralized political control like other cities in China. The civil society voices we've heard from view authorities as co-opting those who can be bought, constraining those who can be intimidated, and cracking down on those who cannot be silenced. As we hear some of those stories today, I look forward to learning from our witnesses what we can do to support the civil society that remains in Hong Kong and organizations that now operate elsewhere on behalf of the people of Hong Kong. I look forward to exploring with the Biden administration the additional steps that can be taken to hold accountable those responsible for undermining Hong Kong's autonomy, basic rights, and rule of law. Later today, the commission will release a report a staff analysis on the role of Hong Kong's prosecutors in these abuses. We hope that this analysis, like the work we do documenting political prisoner cases generally, will shine a light in a dark place and point to a better path ahead. Without objection, these supplementary materials will be entered into the record. I now recognize Congressman Govern for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the erosion of civil society in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has long been a particular interest of this commission. From the start, 20 years ago, our annual, annual report has included a discrete Hong Kong chapter. This is the sixth hearing on Hong Kong or featuring a witness on Hong Kong in my three and a half years as House Co-Chair. The reason for this heightened attention is regrettable, however. The changes in this time have been dramatic. 
Three years ago this summer, the world witnessed massive protests in the streets of Hong Kong. The trigger was an extradition treaty that put residents at risk of being forcibly sent to the mainland. The context was the steady erosion of democratic norms under Chinese government and Communist Party influence. For our September 2019 hearing on the protests, witnesses flew in from Hong Kong. They would not be able to do that today. One witness was Joshua Wong, a leader of the pro-democracy movement, making his second appearance before the CECC. Today, he is in prison on political charges. Another was Denise Ho, a democracy activist and singer. She was arrested and released on bail and still faces charges of the crime of supporting democracy. In 2020, the central government passed the national security law, providing a quote unquote legal basis for political persecutions um, of those deemed um, oppositional to the party's priorities. Further, Hong Kong authorities have imposed measures aligned with the ideological priorities of the central government. These include removing books from libraries, pushing patriotic education in schools, revising history to suit party narratives, and suppressing LGBTQ voices. These impulses are not exclusive to Hong Kong or China. We see such evidence of authoritarian creep in many places at home and abroad. Today, we hear from citizens and residents of Hong Kong who have been firsthand witnesses to this extraordinary change. The fact that none of our witnesses remain in Hong Kong is indicative of the crackdown. We invite them to share their stories and to speak for their friends and colleagues still in Hong Kong who are not able to speak for themselves. We not only want to hear the state of civil society, but to receive recommendations, as the chairman said, on what the U on what U.S. policymakers can do to support those who still desire democracy and human rights. I also welcome your recommendations on whether the U.S. should create humanitarian pathways for those fleeing repression in Hong Kong. And lastly, let us not forget the prisoners of conscience who are in jail or on trial in Hong Kong. Joshua Wong, Jimmy Lai, Sid Ho, Claudia Mo, and so many others. We continue to stand with them and to advocate for their release. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know the staff are, are, are working on analytical products in conjunction to this hearing, and I, uh, and I look forward to the publication as you held up this report, I, and I look forward to the testimony today. I yield back. Thank you very much, Co-Chair McGovern. Uh, Congressman Smith, do you wish to make any opening comments? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for organizing this very important hearing on the very disturbing dismantling of civil society in Hong Kong that we see taking place right before our very eyes. Last October, I had convened a hearing at the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, which I co-chair with my good friend and colleague, Jim McGovern, on the state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong. What we heard then with regard to the erosion of civil and political rights was deeply concerning. But as much as the danger signs were all flashing red some nine months ago, the situation has only gotten worse since then, as we shall hear from our witnesses. And while this deterioration has impacted civil society organizations across the board, <clears throat> I want to focus on one aspect of civil society that until very recently has been very vibrant, namely the faith-based sector and parochial education provided principally by Catholic schools. Indeed, though estimated as constituting only 5% of the overall population, the Catholic imprint on Hong Kong's elites has been quite profound. One thanks to the great democracy advocate and lawyer, <coughs> sorry, Martin Lee, whose faith motivated his commitment to democracy and the rule of law, Albert Ho, former chairman of the Democratic Party, and Anson Chan, the former chief executive who pushed for direct democracy for Hong Kong. Or Jimmy Lai, the billionaire who founded the Giordano Clothing and Retail Emporium, as well as founded and financed the fiercely independent Apple Daily, which was shut down by the government in June of last year. <clears throat> Jimmy, a convert to Catholicism, was arrested and charged with crimes under the Draconian National Security Law, which was enacted in 2020 at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party. Jimmy remains in jail, but he is a man of faith who easily could have fled to safety, like the roughly 90,000 citizens who left Hong Kong between June 2020 and June 2021, 
because he is or was a rich man. Yet Jimmy stayed in Hong Kong to stand with those who spoke for freedom. Such a heroic man. Towering above all is Cardinal Zen, who for years has been warning about communist China's efforts to control the church, in particular its Catholic schools, as well as education in general. The church resisted efforts in 2012 to impose propagandistic citizen education using mainland approved textbooks in Catholic schools, which was a mere 10 years ago. <clears throat> Fast forward today, however, and the teachers are being purged from schools at all different levels in Hong Kong, not only Catholic ones. The Cardinal has been a thorn in the side of Beijing, as well as those in Hong Kong who sought to do the Chinese Communist Party's bidding. Thus, one perhaps would, should not be surprised that at the beginning of this year, a series of four articles appeared in Tai Kong, uh, Kong Po, a newspaper owned by the Chinese government via its liaison office in Hong Kong, attacking the Cardinal. They ominously liken him to practitioners of Falun Gong, whose adherents are horribly persecuted in mainland China, which also, which is while also calling for greater curtailment of religious liberty. Then at 90 years of age, the next shoe dropped. The Cardinal was arrested in May of this year and charged under the national security law. His offenses included subversion, in other words, supporting democracy protesters, and collusion with foreign organizations. The latter is especially chilling when one considers how a communist China, uh, in the communist China, the Catholic Church was deemed a foreign power, with Chinese Catholics on the mainland forced to either join a patriotic church or go underground. Yet these heroic individuals aren't the only prominent Catholics in Hong Kong. Both former Chief Executive Carrie Lam and current Executive John Lee, who previously served as Sec Secretary of Security, identify as Catholics and went to Catholic schools. These are the two individuals most closely associated with implementing Beijing's policy mandates and enforcing the national security law, leading to the dismantling of Hong Kong civil society. Indeed, just the other day, the Holy See's envoy and unofficial representative in Hong Kong, when Senior Javier Herrera Corona, warned that the Hong Kong Catholics, uh, that the, their freedoms they had enjoyed in the past are now fast disappearing, and cautioned missionaries that Hong Kong is, quote, not the great Catholic beachhead it was. Well, it's so frustrating about this, and what is so frustrating, uh, is all the signals that were missed here in Washington, indeed here in Congress as well, leading up to this. I first introduced the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act in 2014 during the 213 Congress. It was the time of the umbrella movement, which began in response to a decision by the Standing Committee of the PRC's National People's Congress to pre-screen candidates for Hong Kong's chief executive position, effectively excluding those Beijing deemed unreliable. A new generation of democracy leaders, as we all know, emerged, including great students and leaders like Joshua Wong and Nathan Law. International observers in the foreign media cheered these advocates, as did we, and there was a sense of optimism and enthusiasm. Perhaps because of that optimism at the time, it was hard to get our congressional colleagues to see clearly the gathering threat to Hong Kong democracy and civil and political rights. Our bill only had only five co-sponsors that year, including now Speaker Nancy Pelosi. As I've noted in the past, many believed in the Hong Kong with its greater freedom and free trade principles could help turn and tug the People's Republic of China in a liberalizing fashion. Hong Kong's basic law was a mini constitution that some believed could serve as a model for expanding respect for the rule of law in China one day. Such hopes sadly proved illusionary. In March of 2019, the Hong Kong government proposed extraditing alleged criminals to China, raising fears that political dissidents could be sent to mainland China to face charges over exercising basic freedoms. Hong Kong's government, using an increasingly aggressive police force, began to resemble that of mainland China and responded to legitimate protests, speech, and peaceable assembly. Congress, too, awakened to the chain situation and with now 47 co-sponsors and under the leadership of Speaker Pelosi, our Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed the House with Lantos Commission co-chair Jim McGovern, I'm happy to say is the lead Democrat. Indeed, that same day, Jim's bill placing restrictions on tear gas exports and crowd control technology to Hong Kong also passed with me as the lead Republican co-sponsor. 
When the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was enacted into law, the Trump administration declared that Hong Kong was no longer, quote, sufficiently autonomous, such as to warrant being treated as independent of China for trade and technology export purposes and further sanctioned key individuals in the Hong Kong government, including Carrie Lam. While we can point to this as a victory with Republicans and Democrats united, frankly speaking, we all know it was the case of too little and too late, certainly too late to help save democracy and civil society in Hong Kong. Thus, here we are, no longer at a crossroads, but further down the wrong road. Where we go from here depends in part on whether the world is paying attention and especially whether we here are paying attention, which is why this hearing today is so important. To Martin Lee, Howard Ho, Cardinal Zen, Jimmy Lyon, uh, uh, Joshua Wong, and all of those who have been unjustly arrested or, or imprisoned, please know, please know, you are not forgotten. With that, I look forward to the hearing from our very distinguished witnesses. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. I'd now like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Patrick Poon is a visiting researcher at the Institute for Comparative Law at the Meiji University in Tokyo. He is advisor to the 29 Principles, a United Kingdom-based organization supporting lawyers facing oppression. In his years in Hong Kong, he served as a court reporter for the South China Morning Post, China Labor Bulletin, the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group, the Independent Chinese Pen Center, and Amnesty International. Fermi Wong is founder and former executive director of Hong Kong Unison, a group that promotes equality for ethnic minorities. Her work running a civil society organization in Hong Kong has been featured in Time Magazine, the South China Morning Post Magazine, Hong Kong Free Press. Now in the United Kingdom, she seeks to promote Hong Kong civil society abroad. Ching Chong is a veteran journalist who worked for the state-owned Wen Wei Po newspaper for 15 years, acquiring knowledge of the Chinese Communist Party's interference in Hong Kong affairs. He is featured in a recent ec Economist article titled, How a Free and Open Hong Kong Became a Police State. Before he left Hong Kong, he was involved with independent media and journalist organizations. He joins us from Los Angeles this morning. Samuel Bickett is a human rights lawyer focused on the rule of law and civil liberties in Hong Kong and a fellow at the Georgetown Center for Asian Law. He was a corporate sanctions and corruption lawyer based in Hong Kong from 2013 to 2021. He was arrested during the 2019 protests and convicted, imprisoned twice, and then deported from Hong Kong earlier this year. Thank you all for joining us to bring your stories, your knowledge, and your expertise and we look forward to your testimony. And we will begin with Patrick Poon, who is joining us from Tokyo. I'd like to thank the CECC and the distinguished audience for giving me this opportunity to share my experience and my view on the situation of the civil society in Hong Kong. I focus on the drastic change of civil society space from the time I changed my job as a journalist to become an NGO worker with local and international NGOs since the early 2000s to the era of RedNet, as I would describe, after the national security law was imposed on Hong Kong by the Chinese authorities. Red line is simply not enough to describe the scope. The Hong Kong and Chinese governments wouldn't even make it clear about where the red line is so that they can arbitrarily restrict Hong Kong people's freedoms. The message is clear. You can only survive if you don't challenge the government. When I started my NGO career, focusing on supporting workers, writers, and lawyers in mainland China, the civil society was very vibrant. We, would, we could organize all kinds of activities, ranging from staging demonstrations to call for release of detained dissidents in China, to arranging writers and lawyers to meet with their counterparts in Hong Kong. We never experienced any interference or felt any threats. Even when I was an amnesty researcher, I wouldn't feel too much for my personal risk when I commented on the detention of Chinese dissidents 
or when I work on documenting Uyghur and Kazakh cases in relation to political re-education camps, I still remember how a Chi mainland Chinese writer once exclaimed when he arrived in Hong Kong and I met him at the train station, he said, I could finally breathe the air of freedom. It was a time when many young university graduates in Hong Kong who would be willing to get a relatively low salary to work on issues that we believe we could do something to help our friends in China. During that time, I was able to communicate with many high profile mainland Chinese dissidents without fear. Late Nobel Prize laureate Liu Xiaobo had so much hope for Hong Kong's support that he contacted me and several others in Hong Kong in late 2008 to invite prominent pro-democracy figures in Hong Kong to co-sign the Charter 08. Many of those democratic figures, some of them now in prison, and myself were among the first batch of co-signatories. We didn't need to think much when we decided to co-sign it. These experiences led me to continue my work in international NGOs like Amnesty, as I believe that it is significant to push China to comply with its international obligations. It's unimaginable at the time that Hong Kong, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly are completely gone. Even prayer meetings or mass to commemorate the victims of the Tiananmen massacre are now deemed too sensitive. For NGOs in Hong Kong, we used to feel secure to organize talks on Hong Kong issues in China and Hong Kong, no matter public or closed door with universities in Hong Kong. We didn't need to worry too much about our personal safety comparing with activists uh, in mainland China. But now everyone needs to have a second thought or self-censor the content of the events before planning such activities. We used to be able to organize public talks by inviting human rights lawyers from China to share their experiences to the general public. Now it's just imaginable how similar activities could be done anymore in Hong Kong. We used to be able to hold public rallies from small scales of demonstrations outside China's central government liaison office, calling for the release of detained Chinese citizens to mass rallies calling for universal suffrage in Hong Kong without any interference. Police officers at that time were friendly and would even engage in discussing the route with the organizers. The police made it very clear to us that we didn't need to get the permission to hold any rallies. We only needed to inform them and they would routinely issue a, a letter of no objection, only formalities, despite the public order ordinance has to be repeatedly criticized by the UN human rights experts as restrictive of freedom of assembly. Sometimes the police would even call us to confirm that we would be organizing a demonstration if we forgot to inform them in advance. However, after the anti-extradition bill protest in 2019 and the imposition of the NSL in 2020, the situation has completely changed. Anybody appearing in places like the Victoria Park or where the annual candlelight ritual to commemorate the Tiananmen massacre used to take place on June 4th would be questioned by the police and warned that they would be charged with Ill illegal assembly if they stayed there. Like many Hong Kongers, I honestly didn't believe that. Unionist Li Chia Yan, solicitor and former legislator Albert Ho, and barrister Chow Han Chong, leaders of the now disbanded Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements of China, which organized the candlelight vigil, would be accused of inciting an unauthorized uh, assembly for an assembly that had been allowed for 30 years. They are now even facing the same notorious charge of inciting subversion of state power, like many Chinese activists. Finally, I would also like to share a bit about my experience as a former court reporter, as I'm puzzled how difficult it is to cover court news in Hong Kong nowadays. I cover quite a lot of trials about protesters being accused of obstruction in public place for staging small-scale protests that occupy some space such as outside China's central government liaison office. Those were already the big news in those days. 
the sentences the protesters faced at that time were only about a few weeks. Granting bail was considered normal. I never heard of any judge at that time would say that they didn't trust that the defendants would commit the sad offense during bail. Presumption of innocence was well observed. Reporters wouldn't feel any restriction on reporting anything in open trials, except for knowing the fact that we shouldn't disclose the facts for cases that would be committed to be tried at the High Court. Now everything has changed. Even reporting details about bail application is banned by the courts in Hong Kong. Judges rarely consider public interest when they make judgments. I appreciate that there have been some efforts to pressure the Hong Kong and Chinese governments. However, the situation won't change if the Hong Kong and Chinese governments can, can't see the real consequences. We shouldn't give them the impression as of business as usual, as they are cracking down on our civil society. While various governments have issued statements expressing concern about the erosion of human rights in Hong Kong, it's difficult to see any real impact, as the Chinese and Hong Kong governments have realized that they can continue doing business despite severe criticism of human rights records. Authoritarian regimes like China and their supporters have learned that they can divert attention of all criticism on human rights by pointing out that there are also serious human rights violations in the democratic countries. However, check and balance is what democracy should emphasize as different from tyrannies. Democratic government should make the business community realize that there's real consequence for colluding with big dictatorship confining the effort of pushing China and Hong Kong to comply with international human rights standards and economic sanctions on senior government officials would be the most effective and mutually beneficial way to ensure accountability. Otherwise, democracies will eventually succumb to authoritarian propaganda, which nobody would want to see. Therefore, I would urge the US government to impose further sanctions on all senior government officials in Hong Kong and China. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Poon. And your description of uh, an individual coming to Hong Kong and saying, I could finally breathe the air of freedom is certainly a description of an event that can no longer take place in any shape or form. And really appreciate your testimony. And we are now going to turn to Ms. Wong. And Ms. Wong is joining us from the United Kingdom. Dear Mr. Chair, Co-Chair, and other commissioners, thank you very much for holding this meeting. It really means a lot for us. I just get a little emotional when Mr. Chris Smith mentioned those names that all are my dear friends. I miss them a lot and I can't see them in Hong Kong anymore. I was born in China and I spent my, own, my whole childhood there. It was in Hong Kong that I experienced a awakening to the universal values of freedom, equality, social justice, justice and individual rights. I have spent almost my entire adult life in the civil society. And my main focus are fighting for ethnic equalities for ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, especially those from South Asian origin, like Nepalese, India, and Pakistani. And other is I joined the democracy movement, fight for universal suffrage in Hong Kong. Hong Kong used to be the capital of protest for good reasons. First, the Hong Kong government was not democratic and not so responsive. After the handover, the formulation of government policies were very bad. And we learned that only when issues were taken to the streets that officials might respond. 
And second, because there were independent media and they have done and they did a very good job that it helped to put in pressure on the government and draw public attention and concerns. And the third reason is Hong Kongers now have very high awareness of their freedom of assembly and speech. So we used protests, marches, petition to defend our individual rights. And the last reason was there was a huge gap between rights promised and rights delivered. The Basic Law Act, Article 33, 39, provides for human rights protections as guaranteed by Hong Kong Bill of Rights. For example, it's the uh, and the ice core. And also we do have a four pieces of equal opportunities laws, namely disability discrimination ordinance, waste discrimination ordinance, and sex discrimination ordinance, and family status discrimination ordinance. However, the national security law has taken away all this right, I would say the civil societies in Hong Kong is dead. Now, no more. When I first read the national security law, I was very naive. I thought that the crimes of succession, sedition, terrorism, and corruption with foreign forces should be of no concern to my work that fighting for equality for minorities. But then I noticed that the national security law instructs the Hong Kong government to strengthen propaganda, guidance, supervision, and administration over schools, social groups, media, and the internet. Soon, I realized that the national security law means a total breakdown on the civil society. In Hong Kong, many non-governmental organizations, we call NGO, that provide social service for the people who are in need. They receive almost 100% receive funding from the government. So after the handover and also our amendment on the funding more, that means every three years, an NGO need to review the side the contract of the government and then create very serious self-censorship. Now, no more social service agency with criticizing government policies. So therefore, there we have another sector that if you want to criticize or challenge those injust injustice policies or unfair policies, injustice systems, that we will go to the civil societies or we set up our own civil societies. So I must let you know that in Hong Kong, civil societies is entirely separate and different from NGOs in Hong Kong. For the social services now, completely silenced. And just recently, we have a amendment that uh, on our professional social workers ordinance that anyone who violated the national security law will be the register and with their license will be taken away forever. And then the Labor Bureau is organizing study groups on the speech that Xi Jinping given in the 25th of anniversary uh, of the handover. And this is very important that the Labor Bureau or the government officials they would count on 
who are present and who are absent. What does it mean that if you are present, you are loyal enough, it's easy for you to get the government funding. Now, there is only those NGO that to be seen as patriotic that you can get funding. If those NGOs, you don't really cooperate with the, I mean, the government policy or join the study groups, I'm afraid it's very difficult for them to survive. This is the case in the social work profession and also the NGOs in Hong Kong. But I would like to talk about is the civil society. I first joined the civil human rights fund back to 2002, that when it set up, I joined it. When I was advocating for the legislation against racial discrimination. And I really rely on the civil societies, the joint effort to pressurize the government. For example, because that was very poor education policy for ethnic minorities, especially those from the working class. And then I need to cooperate with the professional teachers union. And now you know that it was shut down, no more. And then when all the Bakhsani, Nepal, India, the working class, you know, they do not enjoy the equal wages. They were discriminated in the working places. And then we need trade unions. And then I always went to Lei Chia Yang, CTU, Confederation of Trade Unions. But now it's shut down and Lei Chia Yang is in jail. And then I need to rely on some different civil societies for civil human rights funds. Now it is also gone, no more. And then the another issue is, you know, before I used to join the, in the civil society's delegations to lobby to the UN because Hong Kong has signed a a lot of convention, human rights conventions and covenants. And we did not really worry or are afraid of being prosecuted. But now this time, just last week, when they hearing on the CCPR, on the China report, you see the committee members need to ask the Hong Kong official delegations that whether they can guarantee no Hong Kong civil societies will be prosecuted when they return to Hong Kong. And it's very different story now. And then we cannot go. And if I try to criticize any government policies for the media, of course, now I doubt any media will report on it. But if they are said, I might be accused of inciting hatred toward the government. And then it's also violating the national security law. And then I just want to tell you that for the civil societies in Hong Kong, it's very difficult to survive. We could only rely on the public donations during the mass rallies or health fundings, but now you can't do it because it will, you will be accused of money laundering. And then we rely, if we try to go to local corporate or uh, local private family foundations, you can't because no one will support you because it dare not to upset the government. And then if you receive any funding from the overseas, that means you also, you are corrupted corruption or foreign forces. And that, you know, now we are stuck. We don't have any way out at all. So Mr. Chair and dear commissioners, I would like you to continue to pay attention to Hong Kong's situation. And that may be, please join hand in hand with those democratic countries 
that to defend human rights and democracy for the world and put aside those very short-term interests that doing business with China. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wong, and um, appreciate your focus on many aspects of uh, social services and also on the role of the media. And speaking of the role of the media, that's a, a good transition to our next uh, panelist, uh, Chin Chong. Chin Chong is joining us from Los Angeles. Chin. The Chinese who draft the basic law, Beijing reminded the draft, law drafters that post-1997 Hong Kong should only be an economic city and not a political one, which suggests that, that the thriving civil society might be curtailed. The Chinese Communist Party was worried that civil society organizations might be used as vehicles for the infiltration of Western influence to subvert this one-party dictatorship. In early 1990s, I gained access to a, to, to a um, report by the National Security Ministry, in which it identified five social groups that might be potentially dangerous to the CCP. These include journalists, religious leaders, lawyers, educators, and social workers. In 2003, Beijing managed, map, mapped out a detailed plan aimed at suppressing these five groups. It compiled a database of the prominent figures in each of these sectors and classified them according to their political attitude towards the CCP either as friendly, neutral, or animus, and develop different United Front strategies for them, either to co-opt or eliminate them. It set up also a psychological warfare department to discredit those who were considered as not friendly. Beginning from 2003, the CCP took several important measures to abrogate the basic law commitments. All these measures were aimed at imposing the CCP's will on Hong Kong and gradually convert Hong Kong from a free society to an authoritarian one. Such efforts culminated in the enactment of the Draconian National Security Law in 2020, which ultimately destroyed Hong Kong's civil society. Within the first year of this enactment, more than 60 civil so society organizations were disbanded. Now I focus on the media sector. Before 1997, Hong Kong's media market was characterized by its plurality and diversity in their editorial lines. At those times, most of them were Taiwan friendly. To reverse this situation, the CCP started a massive United Front strategy, trying to convert the political stance of this uh, newspaper. At that time, the uh, uh, number one man in Hong Kong, Mr. Sri Jatuan, began to, to, to um, adopt a, a, a friendly approach by whining and dining newspaper owners and executives. The most successful cases being Singdao, Daily, and the Mingbao, which uh, used to be against uh, uh, China taking back Hong Kong. Other means to transform the Hong Kong media include outright acquisitions of shares of major news outlets by pro-China business tycoons like the South China Morning Post, Mingbao, and the TVB. Such acquisitions resulted in obvious changes in their respective editorial policies. By 2014, the remaining mainstream news outlets that were still critical of the CCP and, and supportive of the democracy movement was Jimmy Lai's Nick Magazine and the Apple Daily, together with a few web-based media such as the Stand News and the Citizen News. The enactment of the national security law 
gave the authority while sweeping power to shuttle all the remaining pro democracy news outlets, with Apple Daily and the Stand News bearing the full brunt. The chilling effect was obvious. The FCC voluntarily suspended its annual Human Rights Press Awards, citing the elusive red line of the national security law. The Hong Kong Journalist Association lowered the threshold for this solution in anticipation of the pressure to disband itself. The Independent Commentators Association, which I was uh, uh, instrumental in setting up, set up to safeguard media freedom, went into silent voluntary dissolution. To avoid the acts, the editorial policies of news outlets had to tow Beijing's line. The obvious examples is to call the Russian invasion of Ukraine as special military operation instead of invasion, and turn out commentaries that blame the US for precipitating the Russian invasion. Now, I want to turn to the lessons the world for the world. In a short span of 25 years, the once free society soon degenerated into an authoritarian one. For over a century, Hong Kong had served as the haven for the political dissidents from China. Now it became the exporters of political refugees itself. Once prized as the freest place in the Chinese-speaking world, now experienced unprecedented curtailment on freedom of speech and expression. The Pearl of the Orient, a highly successful crossbreed of East and West civilizations, began to lose its luster and irreparable loss to the whole world. Thus, Hong Kong provides a classic example of how, in time of peace, a free society based on the rule of law is being converted into an authoritarian one in which law itself becomes a tool of political repression. The world should learn from Hong Kong's tragic experience and draw important lessons there, therefrom to avoid begetting the same fate. What alarms me is that the tactics the, U, the CCP used to convert Hong Kong are being applied in Western democracies as well. These familiar tactics include propaganda, United Front strategy, party building mechanism, infiltration, and intelligence, to name the most obvious ones. All these tactics are clearly at work in the West now. Hence, the dreadful ex experience of Hong Kong provides a wake-up call for the whole world. Caring for Hong Kong is not just for Hong Kong's own sake, but for the sake of the whole world. Since we witnessed firsthand how the fundamental pillars of a free society can be easily destroyed by the CCP, we feel duty bound in explicitly state the obvious danger. So I come to my policy recommendations. One for Hong Kong and, for, and one for the US. On Hong Kong, we hope Congress should address, uh, should pass the provision in session 303, the Hong Kong Freedom and, and, and Choice Permission, provision and other Hong Kong focused measures in HR 5421 as soon as possible. For the US, I hope the Congress could try to proactively step up the surveillance of CCP-related activities in the US. Under the flavor of CECC, I think it should find out ways to combat or reverse the appeasement sentiment towards the CCP, which is, I find, quite rampant in the US. Thank you for uh, giving me this chance to ex express my ideas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ching. And our fourth witness is able to join us here from Washington, D.C. And we see how scattered uh, our witnesses are. Hong Kong, Los Angeles, uh, or not in Hong Kong, but in, in Japan, United Kingdom, uh, Los Angeles. And it's uh, we're glad to have Mr. Bickett here in person to share his story, his experience as a human rights lawyer, which bears so directly on the challenges faced in Hong Kong. Welcome, Mr. Bickett. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify today. The Hong Kong justice system has been corrupted by Beijing's uh, repressive security apparatus. If a case is of political interest to Beijing, a defendant has little hope of receiving a fair trial. Compared to the national security law, little is said about the deterioration of traditional common law courts. But the vast majority of prisoners, were, political prisoners, were charged under laws on the books for decades, which have been twisted to suit Beijing's current purposes. High-profile political defendants wrongly charged in these courts face an impossibly rigged system. Many ordinary judges have been willing participants in dismantling rule of law. The burden of proof has been turned on its head. Rather than requiring the prosecution to prove its case, judges often declare that defendants haven't sufficiently proved their innocence. And judges regularly ignore or even falsify exculpatory evidence to reach a guilty verdict. Judges who follow the law are punished. When Beijing attacked several judges who acquitted protesters in 2020, the judiciary's leadership removed them. State media harassed one judge so severely that in 2021, he abruptly resigned and moved with his family to the UK. Similar purges have taken place in the DOJ and police. The message to civil servants has been clear. Get in line or suffer the consequences. Private lawyers are next. The Law Society and Bar Association recently launched investigations into dozens of lawyers for their work representing protesters. Many human rights lawyers have already been harassed out of town. One judge has even suggested lawyers offering services to protesters may be criminally liable as accomplices. While others have gone through much worse, including many that the representative spoke of earlier, my own experience illustrates how deeply corrupted the process has become. In December 2019, I came across two men in an MTR station in Hong Kong, beating and choking a teenager with a baton. As cell phones recorded the incident, the men denied that they were police officers. I grabbed the baton, stopped the attacks, and deny, detained one of the men until the police came. But the police claimed then that the man, Yu Shu Sang, was actually a police officer. Yu admitted to the police that he had not only lied about being a police officer, but that he had also falsely accused the teenager of a crime he didn't commit. All of this was caught on video. Nonetheless, the police arrested me and let the attackers go free. At the police station, I underwent a common interrogation method in Hong Kong. They put me in a room with the temperature set at around 35 degrees Fahrenheit for hours at a time, periodically taking me out for interrogation before putting me back into the near frozen room. I spent two days in custody before getting bail. The DOJ is required by law to act independently, but in political cases, it is the police calling the shots. The first prosecutor in my case told us that the police pressured her bosses to pursue the charges because I was a foreigner who had, quote, embarrassed the police on camera. She was soon replaced. After that, at every court hearing, two police officers sat behind the new prosecutor, Mimi Ng, and instructed her. This scene, police officers literally whispering into the ear of prosecutors, is now common in court in almost every political case. At my May 2021 trial, we showed exculpatory videos and police officers openly admitted to lying repeatedly, destroying evidence and witness tampering. Magistrate Arthur Lamb simply disregarded all of this and outright invented a new set of facts, unconcerned about how this conduct would look to observers. This has also become very common. In these common law cases, non-NSL cases, we see it all the time and it's not talked about enough. He then sentenced me to four and a half months in prison. After nearly two months behind bars, I was released on bail so that I could appeal. The court assigned the case to a notorious national security judge, Esther Toe. Judge assignments are supposed to be random, but they no longer are. High profile political cases almost always go to a small circle of the most virulently pro-Beijing judges. Again, I'm not talking about national security cases, which of course do. These are regular common law cases. Judge Toe, of course, upheld my conviction and sent me back to prison for the rest of my sentence. There's much that the US and its allies can do to increase the cost of Hong Kong's crackdown. I'm just going to address, address three of those proposed actions today, all of which would protect American interests as well. First, existing sanctions are nowhere close to sufficient as a deterrent. I urge Congress and the White House specifically to issue sanctions against mid-level prosecutors and police officers, casting the net wide and low enough to send a message to the civil services rank and file. 
If they continue to infringe on defendants' rights, there will be consequences. Additionally, I urge Congress to finally provide a special immigration pathway for Hong Kongers to live and work in the United States and eventually obtain citizenship. Those now fleeing Hong Kong will make exceptional contributions wherever they land, and it is America's loss and, frankly, America's shame that the country is not doing more to attract them here. Passing the American Competes Act with the Hong Kong refugee provisions intact would be a good first step. Finally, Many American companies continue to fund China's abuses through massive foreign investment. And law in the mold of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that prohibits U.S. persons from facilitating serious human rights abuses could be a game changer. Any such law would, must also permit private actions against offenders, allowing much of the enforcement effort to be undertaken by private plaintiffs and holding companies accountable for what they're doing in Hong Kong and China. I'm out of time and I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Bickett, for sharing your experience as a human rights lawyer, but also as just an individual who uh, intervened to assist someone who was being beaten up and then saw the entire episode changed in kind of a Kafkaesque fashion into which uh, uh, you became the, the criminal rather than the, the, the savior and not just suffered time in prison, but under a, a form of... Uh, freezing air torture, if, if you will. And uh, we appreciate that you're here now able to share your, your experiences uh, freely and to suggest ways that the U.S. can be more aggressive. We're going to turn to our periods of, of questioning now, is seven minutes, and I'll ask each person to try to constrain themselves to that time limit and to our witnesses try to be fairly crisp in your responses so we can get through as many questions as possible. And I'll start with uh, Ms. Wong. And what you describe in Hong Kong bears close resemblance to what we know about mainland China. Officials tolerating some social welfare organizations as long as they strictly self-censor themselves while treating those advocating for citizens' participation in governance much more harshly, leaving little space for human rights lawyers or independent journalists or women's or LGBTQ rights organizations or labor organizers or religious organizations not to mention foreign NGOs. Is this how you see things, that the control of civil society in Hong Kong now closely resembles what we have seen in mainland China? Yes. Uh, I, would say, I would say, you know, all the strategies, you know, um, uh, suppressing the NGOs in China now is happening in Hong Kong. Thank you. So you're in exile, and how do Hong Kongers in exile preserve the spirit of Hong Kong and work to rebuild civil society uh, abroad? Is it really possible to, to benefit those who are still in Hong Kong? We um, live in exile, working very hard to keep our spirit and form different NGO with different nature, different services is we really want to tell our friends that still in Hong Kong that we never forget them. We are working hard, no matter just international lobbying or just we're doing some concrete work to the Hong Kongers who are in need in, in other country. So, and this is what we can do. Of course, we don't think that we can really affect the uh, uh, current situation in Hong Kong, but we do for because of our lobbying, our advocacy, that international communities will help to um, uh, uh, resolve or improve the situation in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, thank you. And Mr. Bickett, let me turn to you. Uh, I think it was often thought that China would restrain itself in regard to Hong Kong, in part because it had made this agreement when Hong Kong was turned over. Uh, of two systems within one country, in part because of the implications for Taiwan, and in part because of the implications for the business community and the concern that they might destroy kind of the, the golden egg. And yet, um, the golden egg hasn't been destroyed by their, their, their actions. 
can is, you do suggest in your testimony that the business community has been put in a situation where they had previously relied on transparency and independence of the legal system, but the legal system is completely um, corrupted now. How have we seen the reaction of the business community and is the business community kind of uh, proceeding forward, uh, maintaining its presence in, in Hong Kong, uh, more or less um, accommodating itself to the national security law? Uh, I think you're seeing, we're seeing a number of different attitudes. Um, overall, I think we would, I would say that the business community, especially the foreign business community, uh, is not as concerned as they should be about what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, I think a lot of businesses are somewhat deluding themselves that the breakdown of rule of law and of the court system will only apply to uh, political individuals, locals, things like that. Uh, obviously, my case uh, raises questions about that. But there are other issues that have come up that I think suggest that that's simply not the case. Uh, and one only needs to look over the border into China to see why. Uh, does any foreign company operating in China really think that if they have a dispute uh, with, say, China Construction Bank, that they're going to have any chance of winning that dispute in China, no matter what the situation is? Um, does any company think that if they have uh, intellectual property that they want to uh, protect and have a legal right to protect in China, uh, that they're going to be able to do so? No. Um, I, I, I can't imagine any reason why that would be different in Hong Kong now that China has decided to do what it's doing to Hong Kong. Uh, beyond that, I think companies are playing a little fast and loose with their own employees. Um, companies are telling their employees, don't worry. Uh, go over there, it's safe. You can be an expat in Hong Kong. You can live up on Victoria Peak and nobody will ever notice you. Uh, I think my case uh, is, it shows why that's simply uh, not the case. Um, and companies you know, really need to ask themselves, uh, are, is it really worth it, the business that they're doing in Hong Kong and in China, uh, to be putting their employees at risk, to be putting their business at risk? Uh, uh, I, it's, it's going to continue to clamp down on people and there are going to be arbitrary arrests of Americans and of others uh, for political reasons or otherwise. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bickett and, and Mr. Ching, in your testimony, you both call for the United States to provide special immigration pathways for Hong Kongers. This has been a major priority for members of this commission. What message does it send if we welcome to our shores those fleeing persecution? And what message does it send if we fail to welcome to our shores those who are fleeing persecution? And uh, either of you feel free to jump in. I, I can go first. Look, I think you know all of us on this panel have uh, a lot of friends in Hong Kong and a lot of people who are trying to leave. This is noticed, uh, right? Um, what's happening in the U.S. domestically or with foreign policy, it's noticed by those abroad. Uh, what happened in the 2020 election is noticed by those abroad. Uh, and what's happening with the United Kingdom, with Australia, with Canada, welcoming Hong Kong refugees with open arms, uh, people notice it and people talk about it. When people talk about where they're going to go, uh, they tell us that they don't feel welcome in the United States. Um, and I think that Frankly, there's a lot of people in our leadership who don't want to welcome them. Um, and, and I think that's really unfortunate. Hong Kongers uh, are you know, ideal immigrants who would come here and make uh, an incredible contribution. Um, and I really hope uh, that the provisions, particularly in the America Competes Act, uh, can uh, be included in the final version of the bill that gets passed by Congress. And Mr. Ching, did you wish to comment? And then we'll turn, I'll turn this over to my co-chair. I agree with Samuel. I agree with Samuel. Uh, the American society has been um, regarded as the beacon of uh, freedom and, and democracy. And yet when Hong Kong was in, in uh, such a poor state, there is not sufficient support for um, a, a channel for, for people coming to Hong to, to the US. And I understand that the, those uh, applying for political asylum has to wait for a long, long time. For example, in my case, I've been waiting for two years without uh, getting uh, an interview. 
So th this kind of um, uh, attitude is quite discouraging to those who, who try to seek refuge in the US, which was uh, considered as the beacon of freedom in the, by, by people around the world. So I think uh, the, there should be um, uh, better access for those who want to come to the US to have a to, to, to have a, a, a this chance. Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Co-Chair McGovern. When it comes back to my second round, I want to clarify that what you you're, what you pointed out there that you've been applying for two years to be able to come to the United States and and that your application has not been granted. Thank you, Co-Chair McGovern. Uh, thank you. Um, each of you has testified in support of imposing additional sanctions on Hong Kong officials. In 2020, then uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam famously said that she keeps piles of cash at home because she has no bank account after U.S. sanctions uh, landed on her. So two years later, have officials had time to adjust, or can you assess the um, can you assess the effectiveness of further sanctions, both materially and symbolically? And uh, I just ask everybody for a brief answer. Um, Mr. Bickett, why don't we begin with you? Yeah, so um, I think a couple of points on, on the sanctions issue. Uh, in my past life, I was a sanctions lawyer in, in the corporate context as well. Um, you know, sanctions are a mixed bag. I have uh, sort of some reluctance on sanctions and how they're used. Um, in particular, if you look at something like the Carrie Lam sanctions, um, they're great in the sense that they send a message, uh, they encourage Hong Kongers, and um, they make a difference. Um, it's also hilarious, the image of her having cash in her house. I think it makes Hong Kongers very happy to know that. Uh, but it doesn't deter anyone. Um, it, individual sanctions against a leader doesn't deter anyone, and that's why in my testimony I focused on civil servants. Mm -hmm. um, if you start sanctioning a group of civil servants at a lower level, uh, prosecutors who have prosecuted particularly egregious cases, uh, police officers who have um, been responsible for torture or things like that at the mid-level, uh, then people lower in the ranks uh, start to realize, hey, you know, this isn't just going to be Carrie Lam and her cash house. This is going to be, uh, you know, us potentially. Those are the people who, you know, they're not going to go out and say, I quit and right. leave the service, uh, but they're going to potentially quietly uh, start restraining themselves a little bit. Um, and there is an urgency to that. A lot of these cases are still going through the system. Uh, once they've all gone through the system, um, there's going to be you know, little deterrent effect. Uh, it's all going to be done. Um, so that's something that I would encourage the Congress to do very quickly. Uh, as for whether there's been time to adjust, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, we don't get the details, but I would, I would assume that by this point, Carrie Lam and John Lee and these people right. who have been sanctioned uh, have been able to get a bank account through a Chinese bank, um, you know, and, and that's sort of the double-edged sword of sanctions. The more the United States uses them, uh, the more our adversaries adjust and find ways to get around them and set up uh, mechanisms to do so. Uh, with that said, Carrie Lam will never be able to travel to the United States. Right. Uh, she probably, despite them not issue sanctions, uh, won't be able to get a flight ticket to go to the UK or to Europe. Um, these things matter. Right. They matter to Carrie Lam. Uh, who, despite everything that she says, uh, absolutely loves uh, the West right. uh, and doesn't want to spend the rest of her days in China. Um, and they certainly would matter to civil servants who might have uh, money, family, uh, and just simple travel plans abroad. Mr. Chong? I think you have to, um, you have to unmute. I think um, this sanction has symbolic values, sending a strong message to those who, who, who want to implement Beijing's uh, draconian law. And I think um, uh, the sanction should go right to the top, not just the, the middle uh, level officials. In my mind, I think Xi Jinping himself should be personally held accountable for all the atrocities he committed in Hong Kong. Right in 2008, he came to Hong Kong and said that the, 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 the power systems in Hong Kong, the three powers, 
executive, judicial, and legislative should cooperate with each other. He is the man who first violated the uh, basic law commitment for Hong Kong. And I think if, we, if any sanction is going to be effective, it should be directed at the number one man who, 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 who brought, brought about all these uh, 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 problems to Hong Kong. If you simply sanction Carrie Lam or John Lee, it won't be as effective. So if the American government is uh, uh, adamant at, at punishing the CCP, efforts should be directed, sanction efforts should be directed at Xi Jinping. Thank you. Ms. Wong? I, I agree um, that sanctions are to individual officers, either number one or Hong Kong top officials. Uh, we send a very um, important, symbolic meaning, even though maybe they can just another way to have a you know, ban of China. But still, um, because you know, as far as I know, the Hong Kong officials, they don't have any so-called mission or whatever they, what they want is of personal interest. So if the sensor goes to personal, that would be more effective. At least it would make them second thought about it. So I we agree uh, also with um, uh, 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 Mr. Cheng. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Poon. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of them. Uh, I think like for the sanctions, it would be targeted on the top and also the medium level that actually would send a very clear message to the, um, you know, um, the government officials that they would not be spared if they would be, you know, continuing uh, their human rights violation. And then I think like for further sanction, that should be also linked with uh, like to uh, uh, influence other businesses also, uh, because uh, as I uh, argued earlier, like we shouldn't make like the business also feel like they can do business as usual. And then also uh, for fam some of the uh, family members of uh, like senior officials, like Carrie Lam's the family are still like living overseas. Uh, without any consequence. Right. I mean, like, I'm not talking about like they should be punished, but it's actually like uh, when actually so many young protesters in Hong Kong, they try so hard to flee Hong Kong, but there's actually uh, not enough ways for them to flee Hong Kong. But they can see that even like Carrie Lam's family can still really, you know, live a good life in, in overseas. It's actually quite ironic. So, I mean, uh, if we want to have really something more uh, useful, then it should be like a very, very strong sanction uh, conditions and shouldn't be just like restrict to a very few conditions. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I'm out of time, but I just want to, uh, and I have unfortunately have to go to another hearing, but I, I just want to, at some point in further on as you're answering questions, you know, one of the things that I, I think is important, would be important for us to hear is whether or not you think that uh, the our current administration here in um, in Washington, or the Congress, whether or not there is an impression that we are taking matters in Hong Kong seriously enough, that we, whether or not we are responding uh, in a way that is uh, that uh, that the people think we should. Um, and I don't I don't want I don't want to get it other time, but I uh, my guess is that you don't. Um, and so uh, uh, that's why these recommendations and and this conversation is important to figure out what what we can do next and what we can do more because what is happening in hong kong um is unconscionable um and some of the people that uh, the chairman and i mentioned and mr smith mentioned uh, these are people who we not only know but they're our friends they're good people who are in jail for no good reason um uh and it really is quite shocking and unconscionable so i i thank you all and uh, i yield back thank you Thank you very much, Co-Chairman Govern. And let's turn to Congressman Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank our distinguished witnesses for their very sobering testimony, which I think makes very clear that we are not doing enough. And, I, and that goes for the Congress, it goes for the President, it goes for other world leaders. And I if you would like to comment further on that. You know, we are living in a time when Xi Jinping is directly responsible for a genocide against the Uyghurs. 
uh, and other people in that region of the world in, in Xinjiang, uh, when he continues to uh, bitterly oppress the Tibetan people, uh, when he can, can commit gross violations of human rights across the entirety of China with the prevalence and the pervasive use of such things as torture, uh, the theft of people's organs simply because uh, the Chinese Communist Party wants to make money. Well, Xi Jinping is directly responsible for all of that and the ongoing oppression of the people of Hong Kong. And, and I'm just wondering why uh, you think we are not doing more. Uh, is it empathy fatigue? Is it that people uh, in the West are, while they're originally outraged over certain behaviors, uh, begin to accommodate and then actually enable, however unwittingly, but I don't think we do enough. And um, uh, I would appreciate your thoughts on that. When Ms. Wong, you said uh, uh, that civil society is dead, uh, that is horrible. That is heartbreaking because these are the people, as you pointed out, your friends and our friends too, but your friends in a very, very personal level. Uh, so please know how much uh, all of us feel for you and for your uh, fellow uh, Hong Kongers who have fought so hard uh, and see nothing but but um, you know, Xi Jinping's oppression uh, in the future, unless the world rallies in a very significant way. I mean, the sanctions we've done have been slap on the wrist. That's all it is. It's not much more, and, and it needs to significantly expand. And I would appreciate any thoughts all of you might have on that. Uh, I would, Mr. Um, uh, Biquette, if you wouldn't mind, you know, thank you for your testimony. Which U.S. companies do continue to enable, um, you know, again, I have found, you know, I'm one of those who going back to uh, when MFN was delinked from human rights uh, on May 26, 1994 uh, by President Clinton. Uh, in my humble opinion, that's when we largely lost China with that delinkage. Uh, and, and sadly, we have been able to get it back. But it seems to me that the companies are are the glue that, that, that helps this dictatorship um, you know, stay wedded to profits uh, and power. Uh, and, and maybe you might want to speak again to specific companies and industries uh, that are acting in a way that is totally self-interested and not interested in the people of, of Hong Kong. Let me also, if you would, in your answers, you know, the social credit system, uh, which is applied throughout China, uh, obviously, many of the businesses are both on the mainland China and in Hong Kong. While it would appear it's not directly imposed upon Hong Kongers, uh, this 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 idea of surveilling uh, every Chinese citizen and business uh, with the use of data to monitor, shape, and rate financial, social, religious, or political behaviors uh, is, is the worst manifestation of the surveillance state uh, the world has ever known. Uh, and I'm wondering how that applies currently in Hong Kong, especially with this uh, escalating influence, uh, almost total dominance by, by Xi Jinping on China. And finally, uh, if I could, um, on the issue of, um, you know, May of last year, the State Administration of Religious Affairs, or SARA, issued new regulations uh, entitled the Administrative Measures for Religious Clergy. And it forces all clergy to pledge allegiance to the Chinese Communist Party. Article three of the regulation states that I quote, religious clergy should love the motherland, support the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, support the socialist system, and adhere to the direction of synonization of religion in China. This is an invasive usurpation of religious freedom. As we have already seen, it's deadly effects in places like Tibet and elsewhere. And I'm wondering, uh, is any of this being applied and to what extent in Hong Kong? You know, the basic law obviously was supposed to uh, convey fundamental religious freedom. Uh, well, how does this, I mean, synodization is, means simply uh, all religions must comport uh, to the principles of Xi Jinping and Chinese communist ideology. So if you could speak to that, uh, I would appreciate it as well. I yield to our witnesses, beginning with Mr. Bickett, if you could. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to go through those, um, uh, maybe not in that order. So starting with the last one, uh, there is obviously, the most notable, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, 
clamp down on religion is is in the arrest of, of Cardinal Zen. It was really just uh, doing his duty um, as a uh, religious figure uh, and was arrested for that. Um, what I think may have gotten uh, not seen as closely in the news with that uh, is that the Vatican actually just threw him under the bus. Um, the I think it was the Secretary of State in the Vatican, uh, the Cardinal there, uh, outright said to the media, well, we just hope that this doesn't affect our upcoming uh, renewal of an agreement with China to allow cardinals in the country. Um, you know, I'm not a Catholic, but that's certainly not the uh, Christ I know and the uh, Christianity that, that I practice. Uh, and I, I just can't imagine them throwing a cardinal under the bus for that. Um, so uh, let me go back to the one that was specifically asked to me, which is about particular businesses. Um, there are a lot. Uh, I think what I'll highlight is uh, the financial industry. Um, banks are a little bit more subject to public pressure um, in the sense that a lot of them have um, you know, public accounts in the U.S. and things like that. Um, private equity and uh, funds are, I think, uh, the best offenders here. Um, there's a great report that came out from uh, Hong Kong Watch a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that specifically addressed these issues uh, with respect to BlackRock, Blackstone, um, some of these major investors into uh, China. Um, another one that I'll point out here is in, in um, uh, Venture Capital, Sequoia Capital, uh, which uh, they're, the head of their China business is a um, high-ranking official in, um, in China. Uh, and their investments show it. Uh, these guys, some of these private equity uh, and um, venture capital firms, they'll release happy press releases talking about their new investment into Chinese surveillance companies and how it's helped that company grow. Um, these are American companies. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I think a big difference with these companies versus, say, uh, just a typical, uh, you know, the gap uh, is that the gap worries about boycotts in the United States from regular people. The gap worries about um, how the, their image will look across the world. Uh, um, Blackstone, KKR, uh, so far less, uh, simply because I think they're very complex firms that most people don't understand what they're doing, uh, and they simply don't get that much blowback for it, and I think that needs to change. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the other questions and, and to, to other people. I know that we're running over time. Ms. Wong? So I have no knowledge about the business sector. So yes. So. Are world leaders, including President Biden, doing enough uh, to, in, in raising the issue of Hong Kong and looking to do perhaps, which I think are needed, additional sanctions, especially against Xi Jinping? I think, um, no, not at all. So sorry to say that because I hope that the U.S. the U.S. should really, really um, defend for democracy because now I think it's so important human rights and democracy against you know uh, of a terrorist so I think should have a concrete action it's not just say you know um empty promise I mean concrete action really to defend the democracy for the over the world and then now Hong Kong is a good case that you know whether you have a really political view and decision to defend democracy what I want to say If I can just, sure. If Please I can go. just pile on 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 sanctions, just uh, I, I think as I've said, I, I think sanctions are important. Uh, Xi Jinping or anything else. Um, Xi Jinping is not personally going to be affected by American sanctions. Let's be clear about that. Uh, it's symbolic, and it would be nice. Um, what about what but, about? And I, I agree with you to a large extent. But what about if he were be to be uh, singled out? I mean, you talk about committing genocide in plain view, and of course the oppression of the people of, of, of uh, Hong Kong is a, an egregious human rights abuse. Where are the International Criminal Court and like-minded bodies? I mean, they're never held accountable. And it, you know, with people like Charles Taylor and Slobodan Milosevic, we wait until they're out of power uh, or you know, the world community finally wakes up long after the bloodletting and the abuse is finished. Uh, this is in real time as we meet. I mean, it's worth an effort, I would think, to hold him liable before yeah. a and, and congressman 
After the response to this question, we're going to be turning to uh, Senator Ossoff. Um, on the International Criminal Court, uh, you know, I, I think everyone uh, in this hearing would probably agree that it uh, has very, very limited powers, and in particular, it has no enforcement mechanism. Um, where you see ICC um, or uh, international prosecutions, it's because the governments have turned the people over. Uh, with that said, I agree with you that there's uh, something to be said for, uh, if not Xi Jinping, um, you know, investigations into, in particular, the genocide in Xinjiang, the activities in Hong Kong, uh, et cetera, and Tibet as well. Um, but there, I think the, the, the point I always try to emphasize on sanctions is that I worry in the U.S. Congress and in the presidency that sanctions uh, often are used as an easy way to say we're doing something um, and then issue a few sanctions on individuals who it might affect a little without changing any policy abroad. Um, and then, you know, packing up and going home. Uh, and that's in particularly why I, you know, focused in my introduction on something like a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act like law that would actually target American companies behaving badly, because that's what we have the most influence over. Yes, sanctions, issue them, but it can't be all that we do. It simply, at the end of the day, does not uh, do enough by any stretch uh, to, to further American policy abroad. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, ask consent to enter into the record the names of 13 journalists or defenders of press freedom who are currently under arrest in detention or incarcerated in Hong Kong. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as you know, uh, prior to my election of the Senate, I worked in the production of investigative journalism, investigating war crimes, official corruption, human rights abuses. Uh, Mr. Ching, I'd like to ask you for a, a detailed update on uh, how, since the imposition of the national security law on Hong Kong, the CCP's efforts to dismantle press freedom and freedom of expression are continuing. Okay. Um, first of all, the chilling effect of the of the uh, closing down of Apple Daily is very very um, alarming. Uh, the FCC, for example, have um, run this uh, Human Rights uh, Press Award for over twenty six or twenty five years, and yet all of us, all of a sudden. After uh, going through all this process of selecting the awards, FCC suddenly announced that they were going to suspend it. So citing the national security law, which uh, imposed a, a, a elusive red line. Now this is a very um, big blow to the, to the press freedom in Hong Kong because FCC has been uh, promoting itself as one of these uh, um, uh, uh, vanguards of press freedom. And yet, it succumbed to the pressure of the national security law. Following the, 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 the action of FCC, a number of other press organizations also chose to Shut down, shut down. For example, the Hong Kong Journalist Association, the other day it passed a law, uh, passed a resolution to lower the threshold for self dis, uh, uh, dis, dis solution. Why? Because it anticipated pressure from the authority to, to close it down. And, and instead of being forced to close down, they chose to to, to try to um, uh, dissolve itself voluntarily. Although they have a very uh, a high bar for this uh, self-dissolution, and then they, they convene a, a AGM to lower the bar, lower the threshold for, for self-dissolution. Uh, and unfortunately, the one that I've, I, I have found it, the, the uh, Independent Commentators Association chose to, chose to wind down 
silently, voluntarily. So the chilling effect is so strong that um, uh, I think it will have a deep impact on, on journalism in, in, in Hong Kong. And you know, the uh, uh, like uh, Chief Richard Bird, the, the president of SCC, he, he's also uh, teaching at the JMSC in Hong Kong U, which is a, 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 a very renowned uh, uh, education outlet for journalism. He told his students to be careful and to be uh, uh, smart in avoiding a, a red line. So if all the if this is this this kind of mentality is taught passed on to future generations of uh, uh, journalists, then I don't think Hong Kong would be able to maintain a, a, a press freedom environment anymore. So I think the the chilling effect of the the shutdown, the, the way Apple Daily and 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 the Stance News was shut down, was quite serious in. In, in intimidating the entire uh, profession. Thank you, Mr. Ching. And, and with my remaining time, can you comment if you have any knowledge or experience of uh, how the CCP is seeking to influence or intimidate or coerce or shape reporting, publication, uh, and journalism pertaining to Hong Kong, even by reporters, writers, and publications who are beyond Hong Kong's borders or beyond the PRC's borders? How do they engage in such efforts internationally? Well, uh, in the, the most common uh, tactics is this United Fund strategy. They will try to get close to you, uh, even if you are uh, far away from the China, uh, uh, Chinese uh, judicial territory, they will try to get someone close to you, try to persuade you that uh, China is not, is not that bad. Maybe you are misguided by misinformation from the West and things like that. And they try to prevent you and, 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 and try to get your, 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 your trust. And then by and by, they will, they, they will tell you what uh, uh, you should report and what, what you should avoid. For, for journalists outside of China, they Right now, they don't have this uh, long arm yet, but they will try to have uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, conducting this kind of United Front strategy uh, on you. Thank you, Mr. Ching. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Oh, thank you very much, Senator Rosso. And I want to go back to you, uh, Mr. Ching. You're you're operating now from Los Angeles, but you mentioned that you've been uh, applying for some form of of immigration status for a couple of years without it coming through. Can you expand on that story a, a bit to give us any insights? Well, um, yeah, I I came to the U.S. Uh, uh, for a conference, but because of the COVID nineteen. Uh, all the uh, uh, flights back to Hong Kong were suspended, and I have to wait for reassignment of seats until finally the national security law uh, comes in. And I, looking at the the law itself, I I understand that I have no hope of uh, returning to returning home safely. So I, I applied for political asylum uh, in in the states, and that was two years ago. And until now, I I. I don't get even a chance to interview, so I I, I wonder if it, uh, if it, because of this um, uh, uh, some senators point out that the U.S. might not be very receptive to to uh, political refugees from, from Hong Kong. Maybe this is the reason, and I hope therefore that uh, uh, you should you should map out a way to speak. Expertise uh, uh, political refugees who want to come to the U.S. So even in a situation where where you have a um, an extraordinary risk should you return to to Hong Kong uh, because of your commentaries and your your, your writings, um, the asylum process has just essentially been frozen. Sorry. 
the, the asylum process for you, for consideration of your application for asylum, uh, has essentially been dysfunctional or, or frozen? I don't know. I don't know what happens. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, the, the fact that our door has not been open to champions of, of human rights and free speech and free assembly who are being uh, oppressed through the uh, national security law in China is of, of great concern uh, to, to me. I did want to turn to you, Mr. Bickett. Uh, you had the experience of, of being detained and, and subjected to extensive, uh, um, I guess, being trapped in a room at 35 degrees. Uh, uh, and from your knowledge of um, the prisons in Hong Kong, what are, is this? Is this the only technique? What other techniques are used to to make people suffer, if you will? And um, I've I've heard references that the biggest fear is being deported to China. And if if, if that is uh, correct, could you expand a little bit on uh, the concern there? That is to main, deported to mainland China from Hong Kong. Um, sure. And if I can just um, add on on your first on your uh, previous question on asylum, one of the big reasons why so most of the activists that uh, you, know, you sometimes see roaming these halls trying to bug senators about things in particular and many of the Hong Kong activists are applying for asylum right now. One of the big reasons why it's just a, a wholly inadequate solution uh, for Hong Kong and Chinese uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, is that once you filed that application, um, all of these people are effectively cut off um, from their from their lives in Hong Kong. Um, if you if you apply for asylum, it puts you on. I mean, it certainly puts you on a political list. It puts your families on political lists. Uh, they can't really communicate with their families anymore to keep them safe. Um, whereas, if there was just a normal mechanism for them to come to this country, it would be less likely uh, to draw that attention. Um, they've also, they're also high, heavily restricted from traveling, so that's a particular issue for many of the activists who need to go to conferences, who need to go try to raise awareness about China and Hong Kong. There's a process uh, where they can apply um, to customs and immigration um, for leave to travel abroad, uh, but it's usually either denied or delayed uh, greatly. Um, so it, it's just really a, an, an inadequate solution for people. Um, on your uh, uh, other question about um, you know, treatment in custody. Um, when I was put in the freezing room, this is a very common thing that the police do, not the prisons necessarily, but the police uh, when you're in custody. Um, there was somebody who died from it uh, a, a few months ago um, when it really came out, uh, how many people were going through this. Um, and uh, I think it's a way for them to not leave marks on people, uh, but do you know, enhanced interrogation or torture or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a it's 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 pretty widespread. Um, there are t there are beatings uh, that people have reported um, and violence from police. Uh, you don't hear that with uh, in, in as much of a widespread way. Uh, as you do um, the freezing room and other things that don't leave a mark. In the prisons themselves, um, most uh, correctional services officers are uh, relatively mild, um, particularly at the junior levels. Um, you know, I, my impression is that uh, I, I should qualify this with the fact that me, because of who I was, uh, because of my high profile um, and because of my foreign passport, I was clearly kept away from certain things. Um, you did see police or you did see uh, prison officials beating people sometimes. Um, you saw them uh, punishing people in ways they shouldn't have. Uh, it was rarely related to politics. It was more related to uh, this person is annoying me. Um, where we see more systematic abuse of prisoners, high profile political prisoners uh, in the prison system uh, is directed by senior officials. Uh, in particular, you have someone like Jimmy Lai who's been talked about a lot today. Uh, from Apple Daily, who uh, is kept uh, isolated from the entire uh, uh, prison population, supposedly for his own protection, uh, but really uh, as a way to make him suffer. Um, he is supposed to be allowed out for an hour a day for exercise. Um, that may happen or it may not, um, but otherwise he's, he's just sitting in a room. 
um, and and isn't allowed to really interact. That is, you know, not, no interaction with people. That's that's truly torture, um, and I, I can't imagine. He's not the only one. Uh, that happens to a lot of other you know, high-profile political prisoners. They use a mechanism uh, in their own regulations that sup uh, supposedly allows them to remove people uh, for protection reasons, um, and then they just extend it and extend it for years. And can you address the 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 fear folks have of being deported to China and and possibly being cut off from all contact with individuals? With yeah, I think that uh, this is a fear for some of the high-profile people. Uh, people thought it was going to happen to Jimmy Lai uh, for quite some time. Um, there were some uh, leaks coming out of the um, judiciary. So Jimmy Lai's case went up to uh, the Court of Final Appeal, uh, which is effectively the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, it was the first test of how the CFA was going to deal uh, with the national security law. Uh, and they ruled against Jimmy Lai and basically ruled that uh, he should be held indefinitely without trial before trial. Uh, there were leaks that came out that effectively um, this may have been because the court realized if they didn't do that, that Jimmy Lai and all of these others would be sent to China. Um, and I don't say that to defend this court, which has been you know, absolutely cowardly in how it's dealt with these issues. Um, but it shows that uh, you know, in most aspects of society, uh, there is always that present threat. And the simple threat of being sent to China makes prisoners act differently, makes civil society act differently, and you know, Fermi can talk about that as well, uh, and, 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 and is, is a huge fear for Hong Kongers. Uh, thank you. I want to turn to uh, Mr. Poon and, and Ms. Wong. And in one of the threats I often hear about is the concern about um, retaliation against family members who are still in Hong Kong or in China. And can either of you shed any light on this risk? And have you had any experiences in which your own extended family, friends, associates uh, in, in Hong Kong or China have been pressured in various ways because of your courage to speak out? Well, uh, what I have been hearing, like from uh, many of my friends who uh, living in the UK, <clears throat> I was in the UK uh, in the past year before coming to Japan. And actually, like many people who used to work in, you know, or still working in the NGO sector, uh, they don't really want to talk. And that's why I mean, like, uh, I'm not among those who always been like talking publicly. But uh, now I even feel that I would need to talk about all the you know, situation publicly because all the more famous ones, actually, they feel a lot of pressure and they really feel feeling that they would be feeling uh, facing a lot of uh, threats and, and, and danger. So um, I think like because of the atmosphere, so even people would feel that they would not want to take the risk. Uh, and then also see the examples of uh, Tad Hoi, for instance, that you already see the kind of uh, pressure and also, you know, his uh, bank accounts being frozen, etc. And also he's still being charged, even though he's already outside of Hong Kong. So uh, from his example, it's actually also make others feeling very, very threatened. They don't want to talk, even in public, even though those who used to be like very famous and also be very outspoken, uh, when they were in Hong Kong. So I can feel the, the immediate, uh, you know, threats they feel uh, and then also the worries among them. Uh, and Ms. Wong? Um, for myself, yes, um, I've been struggled. So you can feel that um, I dare not to call for sanctions to particular persons because of my family um, or uh, still in Hong Kong. Even though I prepare, if anything happened to me, I'm prepared to cut off, cut the relationship with my family. But I know that maybe it cannot help. Another is about you know the NGO I found that I have a board of directors. Um, I, I I worry that you know why I did not mention um, because it, they're still serving um, different minorities because um, my my. Uh, a society is the only one, the first one and only one who do the advocacy uh, for every minorities. So, um, yeah, for example, um, yes, I am fear, in fact, uh, 
even though you know some of my friends you know asked me to attend the UN hearing just as before, because I worry about it will have a do it harm to my board of directors in Hong Kong and my family. So I, I did not go. And yes, um, but I really think that, you know, there should be someone that have to speak, you know, what has been happening in Hong Kong and really call for international community. For example, ESA, uh, the US really, you know, to do something. Yeah. So yeah, that's why. Uh, well, uh, thank you all. I keep having more questions come to mind based on your all's testimony and the situation. And uh, but we're at the end of time. And there's a vote underway that that uh, will be closing. So I'm going to have to wrap this up. Uh, but it's not the end of the dialogue because uh, the commission is working every single day with an extraordinary team to shed a light on on these uh, uh, issues in in Hong Kong and in in China and and China's. Uh, uh, oppression of the rights of people in so many uh, different ways. I really appreciate uh, Mr. Poon, Ms. Wong, Mr. Ching, Mr. Beckett, uh, your courage, your uh, testimony, your outspoken and continuing work on behalf of um, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of religion and, and democratic processes so that there is a government uh, by and for the people. And we, we have seen that extinguished in an extraordinarily dramatic fashion in Hong Kong in an incredibly short uh, period of time in complete violation of the commitments that uh, China has, has made. Uh, and um, we need to find every conceivable way to uh, respond and to resist. And, and I appreciate the recommendations that you've put forward at this, this hearing. The record will remain open until the close of business on Friday, July 15th, for any items members would like to submit for the record or for any additional questions for our witnesses. And uh, again, uh, thank you to, uh, to every champion for human rights, uh, for democracy, for opportunity, and for freedom. This hearing is adjourned.